I don't I don't know how to explain what it's like to not be heard, to feel like you are dying and find out like that you actually were, but to have people telling you that they don't believe you. at the end of March last year and then the doctor that doctor went on sabbatical right away and they put me under the care of a nurse practitioner and I was extremely unhappy with that because I'm like so you just told me I would die if I don't get treatment don't know if this one's going to work I just started and now I have to see like a nurse practitioner no offense to her but so I got yet a different doctor at a clinic to refer me to a specialist in Vancouver who 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 is a teaching professional at the university there and runs a research lab and I saw him in August and they had done a second CT then that confirmed that my lymph nodes had shrunk by half so in five months of a brutinib my lymph nodes were half the size they'd been previously um, but when I went to see him he told me that had I come to see them there they would have not recommended chemo they would have just told me that I should do a brutinib and so I'm like if you all work for the same agency why is it different in a different town anyway he also told me that were I to get diagnosed at that time in August of last year that that the standard of care had now changed for everyone so that no matter what cancer agency I go to in the province or someone goes to, or if they get diagnosed with CLL or SLL and it's IGHV unmutated, they will get offered a burden of not chemo. That's so important to learn because it's something happened there where within the same system, it's not translating and it's so dependent yeah. on the location. And that should not be happening because that's no. obviously discriminatory against people who don't live in the major centers where maybe things are adopted more quickly. And so I'm so glad that you're you're highlighting this because it really imp- I mean you are an example of how it physically, mentally, emotionally, I mean impacts someone when things don't catch up like that. Um so thank you for sharing just, that. Yeah. I thought thank God I was able to advocate for myself because otherwise like yeah or or you know what if I wasn't a person who had the research skills that I have or who or if I was too to, like wasn't able to communicate about it. So I felt pretty lucky. I felt like I dodged a bullet. I mean, you you saved yourself. You 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 advocated for yourself number 1, and I think it was something that you knew to do and also the help of the counselor you talked about who helped you reframe things like this is your job, which it's yeah. so right. I mean, that it's a very different paradigm than the doctor knows best. I'm a patient. I got to listen to the person who's got all the training, right? It's very mm-hmm. different. Um, and so I'm so happy that that happened, Nadia, because yeah, this is a great example of had you not, had you not done the reading and you could have done the reading. And then when they said, look, no, still it's FCR, it's chemo. Right. So it was both. It was the research that you did and it was the advocating that you did. If you hadn't done that, I mean, how different your life would have been. I keep so I I keep thinking now to like that being told and being told in January, February last year that I'd have a year, give or take if I didn't get treatment. And I'm like, okay, well, um, you know. That aggressiveness also explains how I got so sick so fast and why I felt the way I did. But I think of that and I'm like well, kind of, I'm still here now. And I might not be if, if I hadn't have advocated so much for myself, because I think the medical system was also slowed down during COVID too, when I was sick. Right. So there was also that. And I just, it took six months from when I got really sick in July ish to when I got diagnosed. So I just think that if I hadn't done that, that I might not be here if I hadn't advocated. And if I and also if I had gotten chemotherapy, I, I, I just really had this strong feeling that that was not going to be beneficial. I, I want them to, I think it's really important to hear what someone is trying to tell you and to take the time to listen. And I know that like that 
lots of medical professionals think that everybody just goes on Google and self-diagnosis or something. But I mean, um, you need to listen to people, what they're saying, regardless of what you, what you think or don't think. Like, I don't care if you think people Google or not, when someone's in your office and not distressed and whatever, you need to hear them and you need to do your medical job of trying to figure out what's going on instead of just trying to dismiss them. Cause I mean, um, and for those medical professionals, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to explain what it's like to not be heard, to feel like you are dying and find out like that you actually were, but to have people telling you that they don't believe you. Um, I feel like that doctors need to actually give you the benefit of, of the doubt and listen and override their, their, their own ego or whatever it is that makes them not want to hear you. They need to listen. And I also think that it's super, super important that um, that they realize that just because somebody might have anxiety or say some other mental health condition, it doesn't mean that they can't concurrently have a really serious physical condition and, 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 and that it's not fair to, to, to write that off or ethical to, to do that. So a mental health concern and a physical condition can completely coexist thank you for summarizing that. And I think you're speaking for like millions of people when you say that. So thank you so much. Um, with, with the remaining 10 minutes that we have um, or less, I, I do want to make sure we talk to you about. So ibrutinib mm -hmm. was effective in five months. It had halved the lymph nodes. Um, yeah. I know that you did experience some side effects. And so would you describe how often you were taking the ibrutinib pills and for how long sure. and then the side effects? Sure. I was taking the standard dose, which is, which is three pills a day, which is 400 and 480 or 420 milligrams. Um, but the three pills a day in the evening, I took them. Um, I got at first my, my joints swelled up, like my knuckles and my hands swelled up and my feet. I got uh, joint pain, um, just random bruising. I had gotten some rashes and some spots that went away. Um, and uh, oh, some hair loss, like some of my hair fell out, grew back in a halo. And then my fingernails basically started to kind of disintegrate and the tips of my fingers, my nail bed started bleeding and the tips of my fingers started cracking as well as my feet. And I guess like, I mean, that drug affects the cancer cells, but it also affects other cells in your body. Right. So I was having a hard time with that. And then I developed, um, I developed like arrhythmias and, and, and tachycardia, which is a sudden really high heart rate for no apparent reason. Um, so I had a few episodes of that, that were super frightening where my heart rate went up to like 170 beats per minute for no apparent reason and stayed there for half an hour. And I got dizzy and nauseated and whatever. And so they started thinking that that could be from the abrutinib because it's a very common side effect. Right. And so that uh, that side effect in combination with the, the joint pain and swelling I was having uh, made them say a calibrutinib. And, and actually, when I was first diagnosed and started treatment, a calibrutinib wasn't available where I am. It was actually approved for treatment in Canada. I found out later on the same day that I had my surgical biopsy. Uh, but it didn't become available in my province until beginning of this year. And um, so the doctors had been like, I'd been getting a Holter and getting my heart checked and they couldn't catch it. But finally, my doctor just said, look, a caliber nibs approved now. Why don't we just switch you? Uh, so I switched to that about six weeks ago. Okay. Um, before we go there um, with the side effects for the nib, when you were experiencing them, um, whom did you go to, to try and, you know, address them? Was anybody really, you know, there to say, here's some tactics or pills or anything to make it better? No, nobody really told me. Oh, other thing from a brute nib, which I should tell you, uh, my doctor said, well, we've never seen that because most of the people that got diagnosed are like older people and postmenopausal. So I started getting super um, bad menstrual bleeding on that drug. And I had, a, I had like, my iron was like 13 or something. It got really low. Um, 
so anyway, I told my, my procedure was when I'd have these side effects was to call the cancer center. They have a nurse line and I would tell the nurse what was happening and she'd pass that on to the doctor and then they'd figure out what I needed to do. So um, like for the bleeding, I got, I got prescribed a drug that reduces bleeding. Um, and when I'd have the knuckle pain or swelling and things, they would tell me to just watch it. But, but, but that was my line of communication. Were there any other suggestions that were helpful to address any of the other side effects? Um, I really, uh, I really, I really didn't get a lot. Um, that stuff that I basically, I went to patient forums. There's a patient group on Facebook and there's one on a forum called health unlocked for people with CLL and SLL. And so I would talk to people there and say, Hey, did this happen to you? And what did you do about it? So that's where I went was, was talking to other people who'd actually been through it and saying, Oh, my fingernails disintegrating. It's not just me. And somebody said use keratin oil and, you know, different things like that. So I actually got more help from other patients in terms of a lot of that. So yeah. did you suggest the acalabrutinib switch or did your doctors? I had it in my head, but I was actually scared to ask them of everything. I'm like, maybe I should just not. But then my doctor, the new doctor, I got a female, I got switched to a female doctor by, by choice in August and she suggested it. And I was, I, when she suggested it, I was so much in shock that I didn't even know what to say that somebody actually just put that right out there. I, I, I said, okay, wait, let me go home and read about the side effects of that one. And I'll come back and let you know. What a pleasant so. change though. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And so since you've been on the caliber, it's only been six weeks to this point, but so far, so good. So super good. The first, um, the first, like with, within two days of being off the abrutinib, I, I just generally, I felt like something lifted off of me. Like I felt so much better. Um, my joint pain is mostly went away. Uh, my hands are healing. Um, I don't, I don't, I haven't had the cardiac symptoms. Um, and I just, I just generally have much more of a sense of well being that I didn't have before. I, I feel like that's a, that's a miracle. Um, it's the first time I've started to feel somewhat normal. I still get lymph pain in my neck and in my spleen and nobody can really explain that. Um, cause they say, well, they're shrunk and they're small. And I, I guess it, they say, maybe it's just like, you know, the illness is still, still active in the, in there. Um, but so, so that's the main thing that I still deal with is that, um, which is a physical challenge when it's happening and also a bit of a mental health challenge. It's like constantly reminding you this there. Um, and I have, I have some fatigue yet, but but I've improved a lot. And you take the acalabrutinib daily? Twice a day. So every 12 hours, once in the morning and once before bed. And so far the no noticeable side effects. No, the side effects I had have really calmed down. So it's been a really, it's been a good improvement. Well, I just, I just want to say, I'm so grateful for you spending all this time to share everything that you've been through. Um, it is an understatement to say that you've been through a lot. And I'm just so glad that after, I mean, it's been two years now, <laughs> I mean, more considering how yeah. early your first symptoms were, but in terms of really dealing with the medical system and all of the terrible things you had to experience, I'm so glad that now it seems like you're starting to find some relief a treatment that's working and feeling yep. more like yourself. Yep. I feel like, yeah, I can start getting back to like what, I hate the term, but a new normal life. So.